Remember how I said that Final Destination 4 was the only film in the franchise that was 3D? Yeah, I was wrong about that. The good thing, though, with this film is that it's not nearly as distracting as before. And like I said in the previous video, the only logo that I was able to use that was actually transparent and I didn't have to do any extra editing on was a foreign language, like transparent poster for the thumbnail. So yeah, sorry about that. What's up guys, this is Courtney, one half of the Resident Deconstruction here, and I'm bringing you my super late review for Final Destination 5. And this is probably one of the only times that I've done this for this particular franchise, but it's warranted because of what it's about. This is your spoiler warning. There you go. If you can actually avoid watching this review before you watch the movie, I suggest you do that. If you know the twist beforehand, it changes things a little bit. Final Destination 5 stars Nicholas Diagosto. That's probably the first time I've ever pronounced a difficult name of a cast member of a Final Destination film. Emma Bell, Miles Fisher, Arlen Escarpeta. Ha ha! I'm, I'm, I'm on the road today. David Kochner, a couple of other well-known actors as well, including Courtney B. Vance. Yes. Angela Bassett's husband is in this film, and he's also another male with the name Courtney. So, you know, all you people that's been giving me shit, there's another famous... I'm, I'm sorry about that. I get really, really intense when it comes to people named Courtney. This film came out in 2011, and obviously by the title, it's the fifth film in the Final Destination franchise. It's also the other movie done in 3D. However, this movie was actually shot natively in 3D and not done post-conversion like Final Destination 4, so it doesn't look as bad in some of the moments that are done in 3D. This film is also the highest rated film on Rotten Tomatoes in the franchise. We went from Final Destination 4 being the lowest but grossing the most to Final Destination 5 being the highest rated and grossing the second highest, which is warranted because this film is much better than the previous one. Starting off with acting and story, I think it's actually pretty good. They did a much better job focusing on the story this time around. I think both Nicholas and Emma do a really good job as co-leading the film and kind of carrying it. There are a couple that are breaking up in the beginning of the film. Sam who's the character that Nicholas is playing, is dating Molly. He's getting an internship to go to France, and he isn't going to take it because he doesn't want to leave Molly behind. So Molly breaks up with him in order to give him nothing that ties him back to home, and so he can go on an internship. They end up going at the end of the movie together, but that's just something that they work through. They do a pretty good job with their acting. I also like Miles Fisher's acting as well. He plays Peter and Ellen Rowe plays his girlfriend and she dies in the gymnastics sequence where it's a really, really nasty accident. And he's really hit hard by it and he slowly becomes more unhinged as he tries to figure out why did she have to die. We, you know, find out through the story about how, you know, you might be able to kill someone and take their time and switch spots with them in death's plan because overall, you're going to die. There's really no real way to cheat death. Now, I will say, before I get back to the quality of the film, I will say that, that that's a little weird as far as rules of the universe, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Going back to the quality of the film, Overall, the acting and the story is pretty good. I know I, I rag on the dialogue a lot in most of these films because it's really, really bad or serviceable. But actually, most of the dialogue is, is pretty well done. Even between Sam and Molly, when she breaks up with him, the conversation that they have is refreshing because it's realistic. She says... 
you know, this isn't working between us, it's not working. And then she tries to deflect and say, Ken, do we really have to talk about this right now? And he says yes, instead of pretending like this didn't just happen for two days, because as a company, they work at the same company and they're going on a retreat. No, we're gonna talk about it right now. You don't really see that in films when it comes to people trying to sort out their differences. So it was actually really refreshing to see these two characters, especially a couple, have this type of conversation. Now moving on, I know I rag on the, the effects of these films as well. The effects are done much better in this film than the previous film. The 3D doesn't really stick out, like I said, because this film was natively shot in 3D. But there aren't really all that many moments that are obviously done for 3D purposes. There's a couple of deaths here and there where something in the foreground sticks out and that's clearly meant to be 3D. But other times, it's just mostly, okay, there's certain stuff outside of anything 3D related that's a little bit weird looking. It, it doesn't, you know, sit well, like there's a, a particular death that's very clearly computer generated. And then there's a couple of times when during the opening accident of the bridge collapse, people are falling off the bridge into the water. And it's very clearly like, uh, I don't wanna say a computer effect, but it's like a green screen. It's just weird looking. But overall, the graphics are pretty well done, I should say. And this is just a theory of mine but I think we don't get a whole lot of obvious 3D shots in the film because they probably use most of the shit on the opening credits, which are way too fucking long in my opinion. After watching the film, I sat there and I was like, there wasn't a lot of 3D that kind of stuck out. And then I thought back to the opening credits. The opening credits are really, really long and it's basically stuff breaking through glass and kind of like the glass coming towards the screen, but not in that weird 3D effect way. It's just like breaking and you see different stuff coming into the screen. Going back to the dialogue, I will say not it's not all perfect. And it is interesting that the visionaries of these films, and when I say that, I mean the person that has the vision, the premonition, it's interesting that none of them can straight up say what happened or how they knew that the accident was gonna happen. It always seems to be some weird run around as to what happened. When Courtney B. Vance's character is interrogating Sam, he asks him, how did you know that the bridge was gonna collapse? And Sam says, I, ju I just saw it, it and it was so real. Just tell him, I don't know, I had a dream where it happened and it freaked me the fuck out. That seems much simpler than this weird run around thing. Other than that, a lot of the other characters get moments here and there where they get to do a little bit of acting or having realistic interactions, I should say. And just overall, it was actually kind of pleasant to see some, some solid acting and some solid story choices for the film. And before moving on to the deaths, I do want to say that Jacqueline McKinnis Wood looks like an older Emma Roberts in this film. And it's... It's weird because when I looked her up, in none of her pictures does she look the same, first of all. She doesn't look how she does in this film, which I can understand is almost 10 years ago. But in none of the pictures, she looks how she does in this film. In this film, she looks like an older Emma Roberts. I can't be the only person seeing this, right? Also, another fun thing that happened in the film that you don't really see that often in, in media. Emma Bell's character, Molly, uses a peephole before she answers the door. You don't really see that at all. And that's how people die in horror movies, because you don't look through the fucking peephole. That's what it's there for. Moving on to the deaths. The deaths are pretty solid in this film. I think the suspense around the deaths are a lot better than the actual deaths, but it's it does its job of kind of setting the stage of there are multiple ways that this person might die. Just to talk about the opening accident of the bridge collapse, this is an accident that makes you think about everyday shit that we do. But it's over a body of water and it collapses and it just, the way that it happens, it's like, mm, I don't know if I'll be able to drive over a bridge like this. I just don't. 
Now, while researching stuff about the film and looking up the critical reception for it, I saw that critics praised the opening bridge collapse accident and put it on par with the highway accident of Final Destination 2. I wouldn't do that simply due to, like I said before, the effects kind of being wonky here and there. And the fact that Final Destination 2's highway accident was created practically. They were really out there like flipping cars and crashing cars. This accident was mostly done by computer generated effects. Yeah, they probably did build some sets and do some of the stuff that way, but for the most part, it was all computer generated. So I think that takes a little bit away from it because it doesn't feel as real as the highway accident does. Little side note, David Kochner plays the asshole boss of said company, and he's a really big asshole. There's a character, Isaac, who's played by PJ Byrne, at the memorial after the bridge collapsed, and he's going over names, like saying, oh, who, who can forget this person's smile or this person's personality? He brings up Isaac, and Isaac is there, and he says, Did he just say my name? That's not funny. The people were the company. I just came back with tragedies. I'm sorry. We're less of a company without people. We're not less of a family. I see dead We're less people. Of a <laughs> And I just thought that that was actually pretty funny. So the comedy and the funny moments get escalated in each film, but I think they work in this film as well. Now, moving on to like the real basis, talking about the story. One of the reasons why I think this film needs to be checked out is due to the story, surprisingly. And it's nothing super, super groundbreaking. And the reason why I said earlier about how the rules of killing somebody and taking their place work weird for the universe because why haven't we seen that before, right? We haven't seen that in any of the other films. That's because Final Destination 5 is a stealth prequel to the first Final Destination film. Now, that also brings up the matter of why haven't we seen this since in any other films? So either way, it's a little weird that this rule was introduced that you can kill somebody and take their time. But I think there would have to be some more hoops to jump through to really kind of make it make sense in regards to what's happened in later films. But yeah, the big reveal is that this movie is set in 2000 before the first Final Destination film. So that plane, like I said earlier, Molly and Sam are going to Paris at the end of this film for, his, for Sam's internship. And when they're actually getting ready before takeoff, we see Carter and Alex get into that fight and get off the fucking plane, get thrown off the plane. And I thought that, that it was footage from the previous film, I believe, from the first movie, I believe. I don't think they got the entire cast back together. Although at the time that I watched this film, I definitely thought that that's what it was. So that just blew my fucking mind when I watched this back then. And that kind of elevates the story just a little bit more because it, it's a twist that came out of nowhere because they did a, such a good job of not putting emphasis on a lot of stuff that happens in the film. It's based in 2000, so that makes sense that why they're using those black clamshell cell phones, right? I'm pretty sure that's not how LASIK eye surgery was done in 2011. But, you know, you see a laser, you see your eyelids being held open by the little clamp thing. You're not thinking about how old this technology is. You're just freaking out about the entire situation. So yeah, I, I think that this movie definitely deserves a watch. Like I said before, this film grossed about 160 million. Apparently back in January of 2019, it was announced that a reboot was in the works. Now, I don't necessarily think that we need a reboot, but that seems to be how Hollywood works these days. It's either a remake, a reboot, or a sequel of something. And that's not counting the fact that back in 2011, Tony Todd, who has a cameo in this film as Bloodworth the Coroner, he said that depending on how well this film did, there would be two movies filmed back to back. Nothing ever came of that, obviously. Now in March of this year, we got word that the movie would take place surrounding the first responders, so EMTs, firefighters, police officers. And that makes me really interested to see where they're going to go because these are people that are on the front line and involved with death 
every day that they go to work and their choices are a matter of life and death. But that's my soup play review for Final Destination 5, guys. I suggest you check the film out. Again, I was pleasantly surprised when I actually watched it and that third act twist about it being a prequel was actually one that came out of nowhere that didn't piss you off, to me at least. Yeah, as always, I appreciate the support, whether it's one, five, 10, or 100 views. Check out the other Super Late reviews. Check out the other videos on the channel. And I'll catch up with you guys later.